This video is on Chapter 17, Part A. Here we discuss two of the three types of cytoskeletal element, the microtubules and the intermediate filaments. The best way to learn this is to concentrate on where in the cell these elements are found and then work backwards into their structure and their function. We talk about actin filaments in the second video on chapter 17. This wonderful picture was generated when scientists labeled different types of cytoskeleton with different types of dyes. In this case, microtubules are labeled in green, and you'll notice how they are arranged in the cell, starting near the nucleus and radiating outwards. And then actin filaments are stained in red, and they are positioned around the periphery of the cell, mostly. And wherever the two overlap because of the mixing of colors, the yellow areas indicate the presence of both. Intermediate filaments are not shown, but DNA is colored blue. Students have an easy time remembering two of these, but the third one they always forget. So if you aim to remember all three, then remember the word AIM. A stands for actin, intermediate, and microtubules. That refers to all three categories. Now sometimes actin filaments can be called other things, but in this textbook they call them actin filaments. If one looks at the lower half of the figure, you will notice a good way to remember which one is which in terms of dimensions. The thinnest filaments are the actin filaments. The intermediate filaments are intermediate in size compared to all three. And the thickest filaments are the microtubules. So we're looking at the diameter of the filament and not its length. And you'll see there's also a clue as to how they are composed. So actin filaments are composed of individual globular proteins coming together. Microtubules seem to be composed of the same thing, but in two varieties, light green and dark green. And intermediate filaments seem to be rope-like in the arrangement of the proteins. All three are protein structures present inside cells. Different types of cells will have different combinations and different ratios of these intermediate microtubule and actin filaments. In some cases, two of the three are present. In other cases, uh, one is prevalent more than the others. Tackling one of them at a time, let's start with intermediate filaments. So the first thing to say that intermediate filaments are the medium of the three in terms of their diameter, approximately 10 nanometers in diameter, 10 nanometers. They form strong rope-like filaments inside cells that have high tensile strength properties. What does tensile mean? Tensile refers to the ability to stretch under tension. And objects that don't stretch much are called tensile. Because of this property, they help cells to resist stretching forces. So if cells are pulled left, right, top down, these forces help minimize any pull on the cell as far as they can. Most animal cells are empowered with the presence of intermediate filaments for these obvious reasons that those cells are subject to pulling forces when the animal is moving. Intermediate filaments are found both inside the nucleus and outside the nucleus. Many types of intermediate filaments exist, being composed of alternative types of proteins. The predominant protein found in intermediate filaments in animal cells is keratin. No doubt you have heard about keratin because it makes your fingernails and your hair. But this protein can also be used inside cells directly. On the left here, we have cells connected together, epithelial cells, whose keratin has been stained. And you can see the organization of the keratin in the cytoplasm. And the keratin from one cell is interconnected through desmosomes, which we'll discover in a different chapter, uh, into neighboring cells. So this cartoon here shows us how the intermediate filaments of keratin transmit forces across this cell, around the nucleus, and then into neighboring cells. And although the filaments don't go across the plasma membrane, 
they are connected to the inside and at the surface they connect using alternative proteins which are part of these structures called desmosomes or cell junctions. So the purpose is if this cell over here gets tugged, that force is transmitted across all its neighboring cells to prevent that cell from rupturing. With respect to their function, the main word to use is dissipate. So intermediate filaments dissipate mechanical forces across and through cells into their neighbors or into the surrounding connective tissue. In this example here, we have epithelial cells, but neurons and muscle cells are also subject to these stressful forces. So it makes sense that those cells also have their arrangement of intermediate filaments. We don't find much keratin in muscle cells. In those cells, an alternative gene expresses a protein called desmin. And this list goes on and on, but we don't need to learn that. For those of you so inclined, this slide here is optional, and it talks about how neurofilaments, axons, glia cells, control the arrangement of these intermediate filaments to suit their purposes. Intermediate filaments are protein structures. They're made of filamentous protein, long, thin polypeptides that come together as illustrated in these two slides. So the polypeptide is illustrated here, and that's called the monomer. Monomers naturally associate with their partners inside cells to form dimers. And this is called a coiled coil dimer. And if you go back to chapter four, you'll see examples of this. So this side of the dimer is a amino end, and this side of the dimer is a, a carboxyl end. This would indicate that these filaments have some kind of polarity. But that's not true because if you look at panel C, two of these dimers will come together to form a tetramer. And these arrows indicate the direction in which the two associate naturally inside a cell. So the ends of the tetramer are identical. So we have amino groups here and we have amino groups there. So these filaments have no polarity. The individual tetramers indicated here, they come together to form eight tetramers. So this bundle here is formed of eight of these tetramers coming together, and that's called an eight tetramer. And now you can see the ends of either side will fit together just like jigsaw puzzles. And that's what happens inside a cell. A filament is simply eight tetramers fitting together end to end. And because of, of the lack of polarity, uh, either side of this filament could grow by combining more tetramers. These structures are building up within the nucleus or within the actual cytosol of a cell. And we can see some in the cytosol here. And the size of these can vary depending on their need and their location within the cell. There are four general classes of intermediate filament that we need to learn about. The easiest ones are in the nucleus. So those are called lamins, nuclear lamins, and they're present in all animal cells. Plant cells tend not to have these. The intermediate filaments found in the cytoplasm, they fall into three major classes. And we've mentioned these very briefly already. The keratin filaments are very common in epithelial cells. The neurofilaments are very common in nerve cells. But there's a third class of cytoplasmic intermediate filaments, vimentins and vimentin-related filaments. And these are found in connective tissue cells, muscle cells, and glial cells of the nervous system. What they all share in common is that the central parts, the alpha helical middle, is the same in every one of these genes that are expressed. But each end of the filament has a unique set of amino acids. So far, about 50 genes have been discovered for intermediate filament proteins in vertebrates. If these filaments are not generated properly, then there can be huge implications for the cells in which they occur and for tissues in which those cells are found. This is beautifully illustrated in this diagram here. On the left-hand side, we have normal skin with normal keratin proteins inside those cells. In panel B, 
one of the genes has been replaced by a defect, a mutated gene for carotene in my cells. And you can see what happens. There's blistering. Blistering is simply when one layer disconnects from another layer in a tissue. So this blister here forms from mechanical stress placed on this layer here, which then separates from a underlying layer. And that causes massive disruption in these mice. Something similar happens in humans. In humans, a disease of the skin caused by genetic defects in these proteins called EBS. Loser stands for blister. Lysis stands for breakdown. Epidermis stands for the outer layer of the skin. So the name of the disease tells you what happens in patients that have that mutation in one of the keratins. The presence of intermediate filaments inside cells alone would not be enough. You need something to couple them to the surrounding cytoskeleton of other elements or to the cell surface. One of the most common proteins that acts as a linker is plectin. plectin. And plectin is indicated in this electron micrograph by these green stained filaments. The blue is the intermediate filament. And the intermediate filament is connected to the microtubules of the cell. And those are colored in red. So microtubules themselves don't take tensile strength too well. They can be easily broken. So they are stabilized by being cross-linked to the tension-bearing intermediate filaments of the cell by plectin. Let's focus our attention into the nucleus now and look at how intermediate filaments in the nucleus are arranged. So the structure in the nucleus is overall different. It, outside the nucleus, they form rope-like structures. But inside the nucleus, they form a web, a two-dimensional web that underlies the inner surface of the nuclear envelope. There, they give support, the shape to the nucleus, and they strengthen the nucleus against forces that may want to pull the nucleus apart. And they have an important role in cell division uh, once and if the cell decides to divide. The lamina proteins are phosphorylated and dephosphorylated during cell division, leading to nuclear envelope breakdown and reassembly, respectively. So here's a picture of the boundary between the nucleus and the nuclear membrane. And in the nuclear membrane, we can see their nuclear pores. And just inside that, we have the blue. These are the nuclear lamina proteins that make up the intermediate filaments. And attached to them is normally the DNA, indicated in brown here. So they play a very important part in maintaining the structure of the nucleus and tracking where the chromosomes are. The proteins that make up the nuclear lamina are called lamins. Just take the A off, and then you have the name of the proteins that are the most common constituent of the intermediate network. So phosphorylation and dephosphorylation are very important because that's the mechanism by which the individual intermediate filaments can be detached from each other. And when they are during cell division, they can then be broken into smaller and smaller segments that simply dissolve into the background, therefore dissolving the nucleus with them. Although phosphorylation and dephosphorylation are common mechanisms for controlling the behavior of intermediate filaments, not all intermediate filaments are subject to these types of chemical modification. So neurofilaments inside nerve cells, they don't obey the rules for nuclear lamina, but most do. And the other thing to understand is uh, keratin in here is a form of intermediate filament that's secreted from the cells, and they are cross-linked by disulfide bonds to give here its strength. Of course, um, anything that goes wrong with the genes for intermediate filament generation, the keratins, can lead to some types of breakdown in the cell's behavior, and that's been detected in some types of uh, tumor cells and cancer cells where the intermediate filament proteins are involved in one part of the cancer cell's biology. Lastly, we have to mention progeria, which is a rare aging disease that some human beings unfortunately inherit. And there, their lamin issues are paramount in causing the disease, although we don't know exactly how it works. 
So in these patients, the symptoms of aging begin at 18 months to two years of age, and they are detected at that point as being older than they look. Let's turn our attention now to microtubules. Microtubules are not for strength, they're there to organize the layout of the cell. And they're only found in certain regions outside the nucleus. They form long and stiff hollow tubes of protein subunits. And they can rapidly assemble and disassemble as part of their tasks. They themselves can be used as roadways or tracks to gain access to far reaches of the cell's interior. And they can move organelles and vesicles full of substances, as well as massive amounts of micromolecules in directions that are specified by the orientation of the microtubules. So microtubules do have an orientation, as we'll see on the next slide. And all eukaryotic cells, including plant cells, have microtubules. Microtubules are formed from globular proteins called tubulin. And there's three types of tubulin. We only need to concern ourselves with two at this time. We have alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. So if you look very carefully, you can see the two tubulins connected together here as two slightly different colored circles. The orientation is very important because only one side can attach to a partner molecule called GTP. This GTP can be hydrolyzed quickly to GDP. And that is where this diagram takes over. So in a microtubule, the incorporation of these tubulin molecules is fast. And if the preceding molecule that went in a few milliseconds earlier is still bound to GTP, it encourages the binding of a new molecule on top of that. So the filament is growing. However, if there's a lack of these tubulin molecules or there's some other delay, then there's time for the GTP to be broken down in the already incorporated tubulin molecule to GDP. And in that case, it refuses to accept another incoming uh, tubulin molecule. And therefore, the filament begins to disassemble, depolymerize. And that's indicated in the two halves of this slide. Where inside cells are microtubules found? Well, in non-dividing cells, they originate from a structure called a centrosome. Centro means center, some means body. So centrosomes, normally one per cell, they extrude these filaments. Now these filaments, as we alluded a few seconds ago, have an orientation. They have a minus end, which is attached to the centrosome, and they have a plus end, which goes off exploring the cell. And in a dividing cell, those same microtubules, they originate from the same centrosomes, but this time we have two centrosomes, since they were copied, and then they work together to position the chromosomes and to separate the two cells. In normally functioning cells, uh, the use of microtubules has been tailored to power the movement of flagella and cilium, as we'll see in later slides. Now that we have a general description of how microtubules work and function, let's take a deeper look. So here we have the tubulin molecule. The tubulin molecule consists of two polypeptides associated together through uh, non-covalent bonding. And that's called the microtubule subunit. The beta subunit is in dark green and the alpha subunit is in light green. So when they come together, they form a protofilament. A protofilament is simply a single continuous end-to-end -end stacking of these heterodimers. But that's not how they are formed. They're formed, as we suggest on this other slide here, by tearing off and coming together in these helical spirals. So keep that in mind. The important thing is that the microtubule has a hollow lumen that runs down the middle. And the purpose of that is to allow the microtubules to have some flexibility, some bend. And that's going to be important 
in its uh, functionality. So on average, these are some of the widest filaments inside the cell, measuring about 25 nanometers across from outer diameter to outer diameter. Turning our attention to the centrosome, the centrosome is a weird and complex structure that we're still trying to decipher even today. Regardless, the important thing is that it's made of the third type of tubulin that we mentioned earlier, called gamma tubulin. So gamma tubulin forms a nucleating center on the surface of the centrosome, and that's then used for building up the individual filaments that then radiate in different directions. But the gamma tubulin will only grab hold of the negative side of the molecule and not the positive side. So all the positive sides are facing away from the centrosome, as indicated here. One of the telltale signs of microtubules is something called dynamic instability. As we just mentioned, the minus end is attached to the gamma globulins that make up the centrosome. It's the plus side that undergoes shrinkage and growth. And quite nicely, the way that these structures work, these microtubules, is that under certain conditions they'll grow and they'll try to keep growing until they're attached to something. But if they fail to attach to something, they'll regress back down. So that's what's happening in the blue arrows. Those filaments are deassembling, whereas the ones in red are continuing to assemble. It's like the microtubules are feeling for something to attach to. But once they do attach to something, they become stabilized. The stabilizing proteins are normally called microtubule capping proteins, or there could be structures on the centromeres of chromosomes, as we'll see later on in another chapter. What this slide is telling us is that if one side of the cell wants to, it can deposit these capping proteins, and that will automatically allow any wandering microtubules to be captured and stabilized. And once they're stabilized, they will then position the cell into this polarized orientation by continuing to grow and pushing the apex of the cell forward. So the centrosome is normally present in one quantity, and it has to be present on one side of the nucleus. So even within a cell, there's orientation, and that's important. So cells are normally polarized depending on their position of their centrosome. I have brought back the slide that talks about the growth and shrinkage of microtubules so that you can spend a few seconds making sure that you understand what's going on in this particular example here. If you look carefully at the dark green, the dark green is facing the plus side and the light green is facing the minus side. So it's the beta subunit of the dimer that's facing the plus side in all cases. There are numerous drugs out there which are known to impact the way that microtubules behave. And those drugs have been used by the oncology industry to treat patients with cancers. So in a cancer cell, the cells are dividing uncontrollably at a faster rate than they should. And what these drugs do is they interfere with the microtubules that form the spindle. This interference can be in a positive manner where it stabilizes the microtubule, as Texol does, or it can be in a negative manner, where the microtubules are destabilized in the spindle, as is the case with colchicine. All cells use microtubules as pathways for directing traffic to the far reaches of the cell. And that's taken to the extreme by neurons, which have extremely long axons that can be up to three feet in length in some humans. So movement down these structures is a two-way roadway. So the microtubule can be used for traveling in one direction or the other simultaneously. And the green lines here represent the microtubules and the circles represent cargo that's moving back and forth along the length of these microtubules. Here's a real picture taken over a number of milliseconds showing 
a set of these vesicles, lipid enclosed vesicles, moving over time inside a neuron. And the speed at which they move, somebody's calculated, is about 10 centimeters per day. So it takes a couple of days for material to get from your spine to the sides of your trunk. Just to mention this, that cargo is normally sent in this direction to deliver neurotransmitter and other materials. But what's coming back? Well, those could be old organelles such as worn out mitochondria and other material that's been endocytosed by the far reaches of the cell. So this is a fantastic mechanism that transports material along these filaments. Due to the polarity of the microtubules, their plus end and their minus ends, uh, evolution has evolved a number of proteins which have the authority to travel along microtubules if they are properly configured. So one of those proteins is called dynein, and this protein is a globular protein with a long tail. And the tails of the two polypeptides, they wrap around each other inherently, and they form the completed motor protein. The heads use energy from ATP to cycle them along the microtubule, as indicated on the right-hand side of this diagram. The tails are used to pick up cargo. So these tails could be connected to vesicles, or they could be connected to organelles, or any other structure to which they're complementary. The other thing to remember is that other motor proteins can move in the opposite direction, carrying alternative cargo. So K, kinesins, they move to the positive, and dynins, they move towards the negative. So let's check that out. So here's the positive end, and the kinesins are moving that way, and there's many different types carrying different cargoes. And here's the minus end, and these down here are the dynins, and the dynin, uh, sorry, the dynins are moving in that direction. These roadways are beautifully illustrated in this picture here, in that they can reach the far ends of the cell by even wrapping around, forming these pathways. The microtubules have been sequestered through evolution of cells to perform an additional function inside cilia and flagella. So cilia are projections that materialize from the surface of cells and they're covered in plasma membrane. But what's inside the cilia? Well, they contain microtubules, as we'll see in a second. This picture of a human lung shows some cells with cilia and other cells without. And that's common. There's nothing wrong with that. What is interesting is how the cilia beat through a cycle. So during the power stroke, they are strong and erect. And during the recovery stroke, they are flimsy and folded. So how does that behavior relate to the microtubules? Each cilla has a arrangement of microtubules that's strange. It's called the nine plus two array. And you can see here the green structures. There's nine microtubule doublets plus two single microtubules in the center. The other colors, they illustrate the presence of alternative proteins that are necessary to allow the cilia to form. The important thing is how the system works. As one set of motor proteins walks across its neighboring microtubule, it causes a sliding action. But because the two microtubules are interconnected here using a protein called nexin, and the nexin prevents the two neighboring microtubules from sliding past each other. And in that case, when these red motor proteins begin to walk, they cause the bending action that's then transmitted along the entire length of the cilia. The flagellum of a sperm operates in a very similar fashion, except that it's much, much longer. And in those cases, the wave-like migration of the microtubules isn't synchronized along the whole length of the tail, but it happens in a wave-like fashion. 
and it starts at one place and then it travels along the opposing microtubules. The tail then resembles a snake moving across its territory. This concludes this video. Please make sure to watch part two. Bye-bye.